climate champions. Welcome back to a brand new adventure with me, Bella, your climate ranger. Today we're going to talk about two incredibly important ecosystems here in the Cayman Islands. Our beautiful beaches and our luscious seagrass beds. Today we are at Spots Beach and we're going to be talking to Mr. Tim Austin from the Department of the Environment all about why these ecosystems are incredibly important, not only for our livelihoods, but for the livelihoods of the marine life in our oceans. Are you ready? Let's go. excited to introduce you to Mr. Tim Austin. Hi Tim. Hi Bella, lovely to see you again. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. So Tim, let's talk first a little bit about beaches. How are they significant to our marine ecosystem and our own livelihood here in the Cayman Islands? Well, we live on an island. You can't not have a beach on an island. So for livelihoods, they're absolutely important. Lots of times we see beaches as, you know, the kind of places to go and enjoy. So the businesses that get their recreation, the surfers, the sunbathers, the, the kind of beach vendors, they're really important. But for an island uh, that thrives on tourism, mm -hmm. also critically important. Everybody assumes the Caribbean is a beach. Life's a beach. We're coming to the Caribbean, we're going on a White, beach. White sandy beaches. That's where people want to be. So it's no you know, it's kind of obvious that the Seven Mile Beach is our most popular mm -hmm. tourist destination. That's where people want to be, those white sandy beaches. So in terms of tourism, they are absolutely hugely important and they deliver a lot of money to the economy. Mm -hmm. By the tourists that come down, they lie on the beach, they need a towel, they need a chair, they need a drink, they need mm -hmm. a meal. And that really is the kind of the backbone to the economy here in the Cayman Islands. And how do they what, what's the importance for the marine life? Obviously, it's so close to the water. <laughs> so they are a marine environment of absolutely true significance, absolutely. And turtles love beaches. And of course, offshore of many of our tropical beaches are the seagrass beds where turtles live and feed turtle grass. Turtles are feeding there. They then need these same beaches for nesting. So the interconnection between the two is absolutely essential. We need coral reefs, then we need seagrass beds, and then we need the beaches that are associated with them. Turtles come to shore to nest. They can't live without a beach and they're all born on a beach. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the connection is intense. And how are beaches created? Oh, wow. Okay, so these are islands and the, much of the sand that is on our beaches is called, let's get significant in science, calcium carbonate. It comes, calcium carbonate. It comes from calcium, which is taken out of the ocean little creatures using sunlight are able to form rock skeletons. So the white rocks you see all around the island, they all came from living creatures. This calcium forms, and then of course with time the waves break it down, the sea urchins erode it, the parrotfish bite it. There's all kinds of production of sand that then contributes to sediment offshore, and then the wind and the waves wash it onshore and then we have a beach. A oh. beach. And so, so many of our beaches, if you just swim just a little bit offshore, you'll see seagrass. So what's the significance of seagrass here in Cayman? Seagrass is really important. So offshore of a beach, you will find seagrass beds. So sea, seagrass beds help to break down the wave activity. They make the water calm. And from that, the sediment that would normally be washing all around in the water, making it murky, is settled out and it's kept safe within the seagrass roots. Mm. It reduces the wave activity, which also present, prevents the beaches from eroding. So the seagrass has a really tight relationship. We find when we dig out seagrass bed, when we inadvertently lose seagrass beds, that the beaches erode. Mm -hmm. We also find that seagrass have, on the, growing on the blades of a seagrass, the little, you'll find epiphytes. That's a, Word. That means they live on the outside of a seagrass blade and wow. they also secrete calcium carbonate, they also make sediment. So they help to contribute to the sediment budget that helps create a beach. When you lose seagrass, you lose the sand production and you also lose the, uh, the, the kind of wave dampening effect that seagrass has and you find that beaches erode and we've seen that a lot around Cayman. And I guess one creature that uses both the seagrass and the beach is our sea turtles, right? Absolutely. So that is one way they're interconnected. Absolutely, very interconnected. So seagrass 
locally we call it turtle grass, mm -hmm. the most dominant grass out there. And one cool thing about turtle grass or sea grasses is they're actually plants. They have flowers and seeds. Like we're used to seeing plants on upland environments, but sea grasses are plants that about, oh goodness, 100 million years ago moved from the land into the water. So in Cayman we have six species of flowering plants that live underwater. So they're different from marine algae. When you go on the reef you see lots of green, some of that's algae, but if you're in a lagoon and you see those grass beds, that's a plant. And if you look very closely you'll see they've got roots and they've got flowers and obviously the leaves. So yeah, turtles, excuse me, turtles feed on those and that's really important in terms of their connection to the environment and to the beaches. You cannot have a turtle population without a seagrass bed and you can't have a turtle population without a beach because they need that to nest in. Oh my gosh, and that's incredible. And actually, we talked to amazing Dr. Jane Hardwick all about it. So let's go hear what she has to say. We are on the beautiful Seven Mile Beach, joined by a turtle specialist, Dr. Jane Hardwick from the Department of the Environment. She's gonna give us the lowdown on turtles and take us through an excavation. Hey Jane, how are Hi. you? Hi, I'm good, thanks, how are you? I'm great. We'd like to know a little bit about some of the specific ways that turtles affect the ecosystem here in Cayman. Yeah, sure. So sea turtles are really important. They're an important part of the marine food web. Um, so they're an important prey item and some of them are predators as well. So um, if you think about Grand Cayman, we had 600 nests this year and they produced probably 50 to 60,000 sea turtle hatchlings to the ocean. Um, some of those won't survive. They're very small and they are an important prey. So lots of seabirds, large fish, sharks, things out past the reef will feed on them. So the ones that do survive and mature have very important roles in the ecosystem. So for example, hawksbill turtles, they feed on sponges on the reef um, and they actually, by maintaining the sponges and keeping the levels slightly lower, allow the corals to grow. And corals are obviously super important and coral reefs themselves have a very important role in protecting the island. In addition to that, green turtles, they feed on seagrass and um, they maintain the seagrass beds. So they don't kill it when they eat it, they graze it. Um, so that's super important for seagrasses to stay healthy as well. Okay, and what is it about the turtle life cycle that is important for the ecosystems here? Could you take us through the turtle life cycle just a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, when sea turtle hatchlings hatch out of the eggs, they make their way to the water and they all make their way together from a nest. And that could be 80 to 100 baby turtles going to the water together. Um, the first thing they do is swim straight out. So they, they swim out past the reef. They, they do this after dark. Um, that's a, one way they avoid predators. Um, and if they survive to get past the reef, they spend many years at sea. So they, they spend four to five years out in the open ocean. Um, and they're normally just out with drifting in currents and uh, feeding on seaweed and little creatures that live in the seaweed. Um, and eventually they make their way to a feeding ground. And that won't be here. A turtle that hatched from here will find a feeding ground that can be thousands of kilometers away. So this could be the central coast, the coast of Central America. Um, it could be the Florida coastline. Um, and in the example of green turtles, they feed on sea grasses. And that habitat's super important for them because it's really their main food source. Hmm. Once they mature, that's about 30 years old, they then start making the long migration back to the beaches where they were born from. Um, so that's really, really interesting. We don't quite know how they know their way, but it's something to do with the Earth's electromagnetic field. Um, and that guides them like a compass back to where they were from. And then they, they spend a few months in the water breeding and nesting. So the females come ashore to nest. Um, and once they're done with the breeding and nesting, they then make the big long journey back to the same feeding grounds that they were at before. Right, so it's really important that we have these areas protected for them then. Yeah, it's really important that the, the nesting beaches are protected and also their feeding grounds. Wow. Because if we lose, um, say, a significant amount of seagrass, there's nothing for the green turtles to survive on. And if we lose beaches, there's nowhere for them to nest. Right, so it's all intertwined like exactly. that. Exactly, yeah. Well, that's super interesting, and thank you for telling us about that. So, Tim, 
What are some of the threats to beaches and seagrass that are caused by human activities? So maybe coastal development, for instance. Exactly. Well, so like all marine ecosystems, they live in very, very delicate balances, and those balances are so easily interrupted. Seagrass, as you mentioned, coastal development is probably one of the biggest threats. So we build a little house on the beach, we build a big hotel on the beach. That has implications offshore. So nutrients get in when we water the lawn with the fertilizers. We add a whole kinds of pollutants to the environment that have a very big impact on seagrass beds. But we're also altering the environment in many different ways. When we go line fishing and we remove the fish that potentially control the seagrass bed or contributed to it. Or when we dredge a channel through so that we can get our boat to the dock. Or mm. we do a lot of physical removal of seagrass beds. And unfortunately, like corals, they're also subject to disease. So we've heard of stony coral tissue loss disease, which is really affecting us badly. There's a seagrass blight too. There's a disease that is slowly killing seagrasses and we don't know where it came from and what caused it, but probably most likely it was some form of marine pollution that came from the land, that came from humans. Then of course, climate change, that really big topic that everyone is talking about at the moment. Seagrasses live in the marine environment and that environment, because of climate change, is changing dramatically. We're seeing increased CO2, and when CO2 dissolves into the water, mm -hmm. it lowers the pH. It makes it more acidic. Mm -hmm. Seagrasses don't like to live in an acidic environment, although they do a really good job at controlling acidity. So it turns out that although seagrasses are suffering the effects of climate change, they're really, really important to helping sequester carbon from the environment and to keep the ocean or the seagrass beds and the areas adjacent more stable. They absorb the carbon, they prevent the, the pH from getting too low, becoming too acidic, and that is really a huge contribution. And people didn't realize that to now. They used to, everyone used to say the rainforests, those were the things that mattered. It turns out seagrasses are as equally productive in terms of carbon sequestration. That's a big word for removing carbon from the atmosphere, which is what we need to do. Turns out they're really, really very important in that regard. So it's really important that we conserve what we have because it surrounds our whole island to conserve it for climate change to support our future, right? It is absolutely essential. We need seagrasses just to enjoy life in Cayman. The world needs them to help control this carbon crisis that we're facing right now. And what do you think is the biggest challenge in terms of the future sustainability of the Cayman Islands? Well, I think climate change is probably the biggest existential threat. That's a big word, but the biggest threat all around us. Climate change is impacting so many facets of our life. And for seagrasses that are living in an environment that hasn't changed much until humans arrived, this is a really big problem. But I don't think it's completely all doom and gloom. In Cayman, we have marine protected areas. And if we can make people understand or educate people as we're doing today to understand the importance of these ecosystems, if we can teach them how to live with them, so we can live with a seagrass bed, that's not difficult. We just need to be more responsible in how we develop next to them, how we develop in them. So as long as we can work with those challenges, I think that Cayman stands a really good chance to be a leader in the world in that regard. Oh, thank you so much for talking to us today, Tim. We really appreciated it. No problem And I know all. you're going to inspire so many kids. I hope so. And always remember the Department of Environment is there. If you want more information, come and find us. They know where to find you. Thanks, Tim. No worries. Thank you. Remember that you are empowered and capable of making decisions every day that will help the future of our islands. Now, get out there and explore your home just like I'm about to. I will see you later, Climate Rangers! <laughs>